Bust out the windows, put his family on food stamps now He's a big spender, no food on the table And the bills ain't paid Cause he's spending on cigarettes and PGA They'll turn us all into beggars Cause they're easier to please They're beating our people that government Hey everybody, this is the Libertopian Podcast on June 6, 2012 I am Chad Mitchell, your host uh, thank you again for tuning in. It's been a few weeks since I've been on. Um, I apologize for that. I've been somewhat preoccupied, but I'm glad to be back on the show. And uh, we've got a lot of news to cover. There's been a lot of developments uh, in a lot of different areas over the past couple of weeks. And I won't be able to fit everything into the show today, but I would like to cover a few uh, articles here. And then also just Ron Paul news. Uh, Bilderberg news, there's just a ton of news going on, so uh, let me get right into it. I first want to talk about Bob Chapman. Uh, Some of you who are listening to this might know who Bob Chapman is, some of you might not, but Bob Chapman uh, was the writer of the International Forecaster. He was a frequent guest on many radio shows, including Alex Jones' show, and then also some other local shows, uh, smaller radio shows. The guy was just a fanatic. I mean, he would get on every show that he possibly could, uh, and and he was really a trailblazer. He really was. I am saddened by uh, the fact that Bob Chapman has has passed away. Um, you know, as the writer of the, the International Forecaster, it was just a few days ago that he wrote essentially his last uh, newsletter for the International Forecaster, and considering he, he passed away a few days after that, it just shows his dedication uh, to the liberty movement, uh, to the fight against the globalists, and to those trying to set up some sort of uh, one world order, if you will. Uh, from his economic analysis, it was always spot on. He was one of the biggest gold and silver brokers in the world at one point in time, and he will surely be missed. I know that from listening to Alex Jones's show, they are going to be pulling together all of the clips that Bob Chapman has had over the years. I think Alex said that he has been interviewing Bob for 14 years. And so they're going to pull a lot of the clips together and somewhat do a, a montage, uh, a, a visual eulogy, if you will, for Bob Chapman. So I look forward to that. Uh, I wish Bob's family the best, and um, I thank Bob for all the memories and also all the information, the passion that he brought to the Liberty Movement. Um, as many of you probably know, this past weekend, it was Bilderberg, and it was in Chantilly, Virginia. Uh, there was big protest out in front. They they had a, a police everywhere. They had a big black uh I guess banners, if you will, that that blocked the hotel from view of the protesters and tried to keep them out, essentially. And you've got major key players in the world economy meeting in secret there with key politicians as well. It is rumored that Mitt Romney was actually there on Thursday, although... I don't know that for certain. Uh, He wasn't on the official guest list for Bilderberg. I do know that Mitch Daniels was, who's the governor of Indiana, and uh, that's interesting. I used to be a big Mitch Daniels fan, but I'm actually somewhat upset that he was there. Um, I used to think he was, you know, a stalwart libertarian, but um, I think that more or less his his true colors are coming out. And I think that really what they're doing is they're they're trying to set him up possibly as the VP. VP pick for Romney. Not a hundred percent sure on that, but that's that's my analysis at this point in time. Is it looks like it could be Mitch Daniels, it could be Marco Rubio still, and there's still an off chance it could be uh, Rand Paul. You know, I think that the globalists really like Mitch Daniels, so I think he's probably my number one pick. My number two pick would be Marco Rubio because of the the Cuban and Latino vote and how important that is in the coming elections. And uh, Rand Paul has a liberty vote. He could probably by you know, getting Ron Paul, not Ron Paul, by getting Rand Paul on the, Ron Paul wouldn't do it, by getting Rand Paul on the ticket, he can get a lot of liberty activists to come over to the Republican camp, or stay in the Republican camp, if you will, and vote for Mitt Romney, hold their nose and vote for Mitt Romney because they support Rand Paul. And um, 
So who knows what's going to happen there. But like I said, Bilderberg was a big thing this past weekend. You had a lot of mainstream media outlets that actually decided to cover the event for once instead of acting like it didn't exist. And so it's getting coverage. It's getting out there. And, and hopefully in the future, we'll get even more coverage to the point to where some of these traders who are out there violating the Logan Act who are – you know, either either individual citizens in the United States who are negotiating uh, with foreign uh, leaders or vice versa, foreign corporations negotiating with our leaders. Whatever the case is, it's all a violation of the Logan Act. If you don't know what that is, I would advise you to look up the Logan Act. I, I, most of you probably know what it is, but if you don't, please look it up. It's interesting. Um, so that's all I have on Bilderberg. Uh, there's plenty of information on the internet as far as what went down. Plenty of videos. Like I said, Alex Jones and them shot a lot of video this past weekend. And uh, there's tons of it up on their YouTube channel. I do want to touch on some articles here. Uh, Reason has an interesting article. Uh, the title of it is, Why We'll Never Run Out of Old. And uh, it's an economics uh, piece by Reason. You know, Reason a lot of times... Uh, goes more of the social libertarian route as far as their articles go. But essentially, their uh, hypothesis, if you will, on this particular article is that Don Boudreau, who's an economics professor at George Mason University, who is actually um, a big supporter of the Austrian school and of uh, Frederick Hayek, Don Boudreau has said that we will never run out of old. And his hypothesis is that as old becomes more scarce, obviously, the price will increase. And it will increase to a point to where it will eventually become financially profitable. And, you know, there will be the need in the marketplace for more alternative forms of energy. And so the alternative forms of energy will come about naturally through the market process because as oil becomes more scarce, people will use less of it because it will become more expensive. And then we can see natural gas or um, hydrogen or whatever it is that they're thinking of coming up with as a natural alternative or uh, another alternative to um, our energy needs will arise out of that naturally. So I actually agree with this to some extent. I'm not sure exactly how it will work. You know, the free market is great, and I'm a big advocate of the free market. The problem is, is you have so many shenanigans going on in the background. You have people who are trying to manipulate the markets. You have people who are trying to manipulate the currencies of the world, which essentially ends up manipulating the markets to some degree. So it's hard to advocate for a pure free market and then say this is the, the, the benefit of a, of a market economy at times because we really don't have a pure market economy. And then so you set yourself up for possibly being criticized later on when things do fall apart because of the state and because of state intervention and positive positive intervention into the market that you open yourself up for attacks that will see that free market it just doesn't work very well you know you guys uh, you, all you free marketeers and free traders you guys are crazy it doesn't work um, but the reality is we know it does work historically it works the problem is, is when you have a bunch of positive intervention, you have consequences that arise from those positive interventions as Henry Hazlitt talked about in his Economics in One Lesson. So that's an interesting article. I would definitely check it out. Um, obviously, last night was a big night in politics, and I'm not a big political guy. I don't grandstand for the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or even the Libertarian Party. You know, I just like to talk about principles, and I like to try to educate people and, and really talk about about ideas more so than anything else. But last night, um, Walker in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, there was a recall election there, and they were basically, the unions were mad at Scott Walker for all the union busting that he was doing, which I'm for 100%, especially for, you know, mainly just because it's public employee unions, and I don't agree with public employee unions at all. There shouldn't be public employee unions. And before I go into this, let me explain a little something about public employee unions. The point of a union and the reason why unions came into existence was essentially the fear, and I'm not going to justify whether or not that fear was misplaced or not, 
But the initial fear which led to the idea of unions coming into existence was the idea that after the pursuit of profit, employers would unduly suppress workers' wages and make unsafe working conditions or lower working conditions simply to make a profit. Even if it was unsafe for the workers, and even if he was constantly lowering the workers' wage, he would do so to pursue profit. It made sense for the workers to join together and collectively bargain together and stand together and say, "No, we're you know you're not going you're going to treat us with some human dignity. You're not going to walk all over us and treat us like slaves." And I'm for that to an extent. You know, I don't like it when unions use the government use the political means of government to try to achieve their goals. But I think that there is definitely a place in the free market for people to voluntarily contract with one another uh, in the workplace and say, you know what, we're going to join together and we're going to demand to be treated fairly by this company. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, with public employee unions, the government is not a business. There is no pursuit of profit. So essentially, public employee unions, you're strengthening yourself to hold, what, the taxpayer hostage? You want to protect yourself and your salary and your pensions from the frugal taxpayer that's tired of paying for, for all the garbage and all the benefits um, that, 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 that you soak up. And some of it, you know, you're due. I get that. But a lot of it is you're not due. You know, it, it's, you know, a lot of these pensions and a lot of the benefits that some of these public employees are getting are not equivalent to what you would get in a free market job. They're not equivalent to that. And, you know, like I said, to, to blame Scott Walker solely for this is, is really misplaced because Walker came into this position. And I'm not, like I said, I'm not a Republican grandstander. I'm not just, you know, trying to build up the Republican Party. I have my issues with the Republican Party, but he walked into a situation in Wisconsin, he made the tough decisions, he showed leadership, and he balanced the budget in Wisconsin. That says a lot about his character, and I think the Wisconsin voters, because they didn't recall him, the, uh, aside from all, the, all of the uh, union uh, demagoguery, if you will, and them basically going after him, he still won the election. The recall election was won by Scott Walker, and that's the first time in this nation's history that that's happened. And that's because the people in Wisconsin overall know that things have to change, that you cannot continue to spin like the Dickens and expect there to be a future for your children and a future for your grandchildren. There has to be a stopping point. There has to be a point where this nation becomes, as a whole, from the community to the state, to the federal government, there has to be a point where you say enough is enough, we're going to stop spending money, we're going to start to produce things and save money and act frugally again and be responsible. Right now as a nation we don't do that. We spend like crazy, the government spends like crazy, consumers spend like crazy, we run up huge trade deficits. It's not sustainable in the long run. We are living off of the past. We're living off of the past strength of the dollar because the dollar is the world reserve currency. We are living off of that and one day it will not be there. And when it's not there, we will not have the industrial base that we need to sustain the current consumption levels that this country takes in at the moment. So that's my take on the Scott Walker situation in Wisconsin. Um, I think it's an interesting story. I think that you know overall it shows a change in the American culture that I find positive. Uh, there's a lot of political grandstanding going on with it to say, oh, Obama's done. Obama's not done. And it's a mistake right now to think that Obama is done. I, the, the, the Republicans, from a political standpoint, if they think that this means that they can lay back and Barack Obama is finished for, they will be sorely mistaken come November. And I don't want Obama to be reelected. I don't really want Romney to be elected either, but I don't really have a choice in the matter. But if I had to choose, I'd say Romney would probably be the better candidate than, uh, Ron, uh, than Obama, but it's not like he's that much better, right? So... If I have to choose one, which I'm not saying I'm going to vote for Romney, I'm just saying that out of the two, Romney is definitely going to be the better pick. And if the Republican Party wants to make sure that Romney gets that nod by the American people, they cannot take Obama lightly at all. So, moving on to the next article, Michelle Obama um, 
is basically applauding uh, Bloomberg in New York with his new soda man. So essentially, I think it's a 32 ounce. If you have a 32 ounce soda, uh, well, you won't have it. It's banned. You can't have a 32 ounce soda at all. So if you're poor and you have five kids and it's cheaper for you to get a 32 ounce soda and share it amongst all of your kids, you can't do that. You've got to buy, you know, individually maybe 16 ounce or 8 ounce, which is probably going to cost you another arm and a leg. So it's just more big government from these liberal states that they're not liberal. They're 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 authoritarian and they're trying to run the public citizenry into the ground and basically turn zombies into mush because I mean most of their citizens are already zombies but they'll basically just be running them into the ground underneath the oppression of the state and so uh, Michelle Obama is applying it even though she says there will be no federal ban on soda uh, she's obviously on this health kick you know and I saw a book the other day I was in Barnes and Noble and Michelle Obama's got a book out about home, home gardening. Can you believe this shit? Home gardening. And what, what, what's happening? The, the, um, the uh, USDA, the EPA are going after these farmers. Oh, you, you sell raw milk? You have milk on a farm? Um, you have this, you have that on a farm? We're coming after you, baby. If you're not part of Big Agra, we're going to take you down to Chinatown. And But at the same time, Michelle Obama is saying, we need the home garden. We need people out there to do their own gardening. Well, I would like to do my own gardening, but I'm afraid that a SWAT team is going to come up with Homeland Security badges and uh, just take me out. You know, that, that very well may happen. And so it, it just it astounds me at just it, how in the face these criminals are. And, and they're just in your face with it. I mean, I don't even know what else to say. Putting out books, you need to garden at home. But when you do garden, we'll be surely there to put you in the private prisons. I mean, it's it's insane. It's completely insane. And uh, frankly, I am tired of it. Um, moving on, um, there's not too much uh, else from an article standpoint besides Bilderberg, a few of these articles, obviously the Scott Walker situation. I would like to point out, if you don't know, that I live in Shreveport, Louisiana. And last week, uh, I believe it was Saturday, they had the Republican State Convention in Shreveport, Louisiana. And needless to say, it was a circus. Um, as I expected... The Republican Party decided that because the Santorum camp, because Santorum's out, and the Romney camp are, are not organized or as organized as they should be and do not have the, 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 dedica the dedicated supporters to have gone, gone out during the caucus and elected delegates and were going to be active in the, the delegate process at the state convention, that because of that, and because Ron Paul was going to run away with the L.A. State Convention, they decided to change the rules. Completely illegal, completely wrong, and what? how are they painting it? They're saying that the Ron Paul people are trying to steal votes from this, the people who voted for Santorum and Romney. So now, the Republican Party is just populist. They are all about your vote as a Republican voter. That is nonsense. All the Ron Paul campaign is doing, whether they win or not, which it, it clearly they're not going to win at this point. It's been a heck of a run, though, and I applaud them for it, but they're not going to win at this point. But what they are effectively doing is exposing the insiderness and croniness of the Republican Party and how these state conventions work. And it basically shows you that as a Republican voter, your vote means nothing. For the most part, it means nothing. Yes, some some delegates are bound, but a lot of them are not bound. And so and uh, the way the rules are set up, it, a lot of times even some of the bound ones can even go over to a, a, you know another uh, candidate. So essentially... These rules have been devised to help the establishment candidate, and now that they're being used to help the anti-establishment candidate, we're going to demonize those who are exposing us for our dirty tricks to begin with. And so, you know, I think that 
the best thing that could happen from here is that the average Republican voter shouldn't be mad at Ron Paul and the Ron Paul campaign, regardless of what you think about Ron Paul's politics, if you don't like Ron Paul, whatever the case is. I wouldn't be mad at Ron Paul. Be mad at the Republican Party. How did you have rules set up this way to where our votes didn't carry more weight? We didn't vote for Ron Paul. We voted for Santorum, or we voted for Mitt Romney. But the way you have the rules set up, the Paul people are able to come in and take it over. Right? And so, hopefully, this will show people how the party system works and how essentially your vote means nothing to these people. It's all about the candidate that they want in office. So, you know, it was crazy because the Ron Paul people voted for a chairman. He was up there speaking. They changed the rules. I don't know the whole story behind it. I don't know if he refused to step down and he was still speaking or whatever the case was. Essentially, I believe it was the Shreveport Police Department um, acted. I'm not going to say they acted like thugs. They just basically took the, their orders from the Republican establishment and decided to go ahead and remove this guy who, contrary to popular belief, you know, everyone pictures the Ron Paul supporter as the 20-year-old dope-smoking hippie. The reality was this guy was an elderly gen gentleman. He wasn't super old. I would say he was probably in his 50s. Uh, he was telling the officers, there was four or five officers on him trying to drag him out. He wasn't, I wouldn't say he was, he was resisting arrest. They were just saying, hey, he's the chairman. He's telling the officers at the same time that, hey, I'm handicapped. I've got a handicap. Please, you know, blah, 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 blah. And basically, he ended up getting thrown to the ground. And so I'm thinking to myself, was all that really necessary? Really? Simply because you don't like the fact that we're playing the game better than you. You're going to bring in. Uh, pol you know, police thugs. You're going to bring in, you know, a Gestapo, if you will, and they're going to take us out back and show us who the boss is, kind of thing. I don't, I just don't get that. So, like I said, hopefully this will expose the Republican Party and the Democratic Party for what they are, and get people to demand better from these parties. You know, if we're going to have these parties, we need to demand better from them and say, hey, look, our votes need to carry more weight. When we vote in a caucus or we vote in the uh, popular vote election, the straw poll, they need to carry more weight. Don't push it on us like, hey, the primaries this week, your vote really counts. Get out there and vote for Mitt Romney. But then when it comes down to it, our vote really didn't mean a whole lot, did it? So hopefully this might spur some change in the party system. I hope it does. It may or may not. We'll have to see. Um, moving on, uh, as I finish up here on this weekly podcast, uh, again on June 6, 2012, I have really dedicated myself to reading again and trying to continue to educate myself on um, many different aspects. You know, I've got some, some different uh, influences, uh, just different people that I talk to who, you know, talk to me about conservative philosophy, talk to me about liberty, you know, uh, libertarian philosophy, talk to me about anarchy. I, I am open-minded to a lot of these different philosophies. And so I'm going through a lot of books. I'm going to start at the end of these podcasts telling you what I'm currently reading and what I finish reading. That way, if you're listening and you're interested in following along with me or at least reading some of the same books that I'm looking at right now and you haven't read them before, it gives you an opportunity to do that. Uh, so what I'm currently reading right now is a book called uh, uh, Against the Tide. Uh, it's written by Wilhelm Ropke, who was an Austrian economist, a German Austrian economist, who... Um, very famous, but more on the conservative traditionalist side. He wasn't quite as, you know, he was more skeptical of the market. Um, even though he was for the market, he wasn't for a pure free market. You know, he was more almost in the Hayek camp where it was planned for competition. You know, you want a, a moral market kind of thing. But it's an interesting book. I will say that if you're interested in how trade works, and how the trade deficit, trade surplus situation works, and how the balance of payments work, 
this is an excellent book to read. He really, it's, it's, it's difficult to follow. You have to understand the terminology. But he's the first person to really break down the balance of payments in a way that I believe is accurate. And, uh, and he breaks it down flawlessly. Another book that I'm currently reading, because I'm reading two of them at the time, and this, this book is going to take me quite a while to read. It's, I believe, 1,300 or 1,400 pages long. It's um, um, Tragedy and Hope. I, I had a blank out there. I couldn't remember if it was Hope and Tragedy or Tragedy and Hope. Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley, who um, this is more of a cons uh, uh, conspiratorial book for a lot of people, uh, but I find the history in this book to be fascinating. Uh, Carol Quigley was Bill Clinton's mentor. He was um, a hit, or he is, I, I don't, I'm not sure if he's still alive or not, but he was at least a history professor at Georgetown University. And so he knows what he's talking about, and he's got a definitely the historical context down, and the book is amazing from what I've read so far as far as how detailed it is. Uh, but he does go into who the real controllers and elite are in the world today and in the past, who, have they, who they've been, the financial interests at stake, and the financial oligarchs. He goes into all of it. Uh, has received a lot of criticism from from other historians for tackling such, such subjects, but you know I almost see the guy as someone who is coming out and saying, "Look, this stuff is real." Maybe my uh, counterparts, my other historians, are they're afraid to come out with it. They've seen the evidence; they might know it's real as well, but they won't come out because they're afraid of being ostracized by the academic community. Something to that uh, respect. So. Um, I'm reading that currently as well, so I would recommend both of those books. Check them out. Uh, the Wilhelm Ropke book is on Mises.org. In the literature section, you can just uh, type in Ropke or Wilhelm Ropke in there, and it should pull up all of his works. Um, I would like to go through the book that I just finished. A lot of you might have already read this book before. It is Our Enemy, The State by Albert J. Nock. Excellent, excellent book. I was thoroughly impressed. It really changed. I'm not going to say changed. I've always had this view of the state, but it gives you more dialogue to work with. It gives you a viewpoint of you know state versus social power in ways to debate and look at things differently. And that's the key. When you're debating people and when you're educating yourself to these concepts of political philosophy, it's important to get, you know, even if, even if it's in the same philosophy, if it's libertarian philosophy, it's still good to get different viewpoints within that philosophy. Same thing if, if you're more of a conservative and you're you're reading Kirk or you know T. S. Eliot or Nisbet or uh, one of those guys, you know, Robert Weaver, someone like that, you want to read a lot of those guys because all even their philosophies aren't identical and you can get different perspectives. And so that's gonna help you out. It's gonna help you learn a lot and then you can really nail down what you really believe and what you take away from each one of those philosophies and uh, incorporate into your own belief system so um, that's all I have on that front um, I will try to do that every week um, I don't I, I work a full-time job as well as do this podcast so I, I don't have all day to read books although I would love to read books all day long but um, as I get finished with them, I will let you know and, and give somewhat of a review of the book that I just finished as well. So other than that, that's all I have. Thank you for tuning in to the Libertopian podcast on this week's edition, and I look forward to talking to you guys next week. Have a good one.